I just want everyone to know that's been involved in my case, and that I know that I have been a disappointment, and that I am very angry at myself, and that I want to be a good person, and I don't want to go through the court system like this. I hate it. We've been following mom, Delina, since 2000 when a judge pointed her out to our producers as one of the few kids who defy the odds. We were told if ever there was a success story in the child welfare system, this teenage mom is the girl. I had to take my mom to court and prove that she was an unfit parent um, and that, um, you know, I was doing fine in foster care um, and um, I was also old enough. Um, I was um, 16 whenever I did it. And they looked at my mom's background. My mom had been in prison for educational neglect. And then she had also not had us for eight and a half years. I had to prove that my mom, you know, was not the person, you know, that should be in my life. And I sure did. So with no real parent to care for her, juvenile court has become a way of life for Delina. A surreal second home where decisions that dictate a child's future become a safety net from a lifetime of abuse. Having lived in more than 15 foster homes since first becoming a ward of the state, Delina is back before Judge Taliaferro for this six-month review hearing. Let's go on the record, please, in the matter of Delina. This matter is set today for a review hearing. Who's with you, Delina? My foster mother, Kathy Brown. Delina was 14 when she got pregnant with her son, Gavin, and both remain wards of the court. Shortly after his birth, Delina went to live with foster mom, Kathy Brown, the three have been a family ever since. So how's the baby? He's great. He is so smart. He's two and a half, and I actually have a picture. Oh, I'd love to see it. Well, I guess your foster mother's not proud of him. Is that right? <laughs> not at all. Oh, not at all. Is that right? <laughs> Nor Oh, that's her. wonderful. He's, ad he's adorable. Thank you. Delaney, you've done very well in foster care. You, there's not been one problem since you've been placed in foster care. Not one. But take care of yourself. See you in about six months. She's done such a great job. Yes, she, she has. really has. I'm so proud of her. She wants to be independent. She's scared to death of being independent. Um, she thinks she can take care of herself. She's pretty sure she can't take care of herself and Gavin alone right now. Um, I hope she knows, um, and we've talked about this, they can live with me as long as they want. Delina is a senior in high school and thriving both academically and at home. Everyone involved in her case admits Delina is more than just a successful foster child. She's an extraordinary teen who has never been in trouble with the law and has refused to let a lifetime on the child welfare system destroy her dreams. With a judge rooting for her and a supportive foster mom, everything seems to be on track for Delina as her 18th birthday approaches. If only it could have stayed this way. I'm really ashamed of myself. She took me as a teenager with my son, took me into her house, and then in a way I, I betrayed her. When we see Delina again just a few months later, her life has crumbled around her. For reasons even she can't explain, Delina stole two checks from foster mom Kathy Brown, then ran away from home. After a week on the run, missing her son Gavin was too much to bear. And so I called Beth. I said, I can't do this anymore. I need to see him. I took myself to the youth shelter, and then I lost him, and I haven't seen him. I didn't get to see him for weeks, for weeks, and that was just... And then the first time I saw him, the first thing he said to me was, Mommy, are you sad? And I just, I could not believe it. I mean, just how much him and I had been together, he just, he knew. He could feel it. Delina now lives in yet another new foster home while she awaits her trial on theft and forgery charges. She is allowed to see Gavin only twice a week, and those visits are supervised by a social worker. Gavin continues to live with foster mom Kathy Brown as Delina awaits trial. As the weeks pass, Delina knows her fate lies in one person's hands. And even Judge Taliaferro admits this is one court date she never expected. Well, I hate to say that I was disappointed because that's not fair to Delena, because obviously this is Delena's struggle. 
It's surprising, but we shouldn't be so surprised because after all, it has to be frightening for a young person almost 18 years of age uh, without a solid family, without family support, the things that many of us take for granted. Delina is on trial for forging two of Kathy Brown's checks, totaling almost $400. Let's go on the record, please. This is it. Deputy yeah. prosecuting attorney Brett Raper tries to get to the bottom of why a model foster child like Delina would risk everything for a random friend who said he needed the money. What were you going to do with the money uh, that you received from these items? I was going to give it to a person that I liked, that wanted it. Next on the stand is Delina's child welfare case manager, Michelle Fields. Like Judge Taliaferro, Michelle has been one of Delina's biggest supporters during her 12 years in the system. She was considered the star child, you know, one of the kids on our caseload that you talk highly about, that you say, I wish I had more kids like Delina. Um, she was out speaking to other teenagers about um, not getting pregnant at a young age and why you shouldn't do that. But not even Michelle can find an excuse for Delina's current mess. One of the recommendations is that Delina go to secure detention uh, today uh, for five days of the 30 possible days. Any concerns about that? I don't think she understands that if she were an adult, five days would be a miracle. In addition, she has a child to which this is negatively affecting. And the woman who gave Delina the first real home she's ever known tells the court she what supports to a tough love um, approach. I agree with the recommendations. Delina also said to me, Kathy, I never meant to hurt you. I didn't think you'd find out. This did hurt you very much, though, did not it? It, it? It's been devastating. I told Delina in the first time we ever met when she said, I just want a place to live where I'm wanted. I want to be part of a family. I said, that's what I want. I want a, a family. I've been saving for her college. I didn't know what else to do when I found out she forged the checks than to, to press criminal charges. I wanted to be Delina's mother and Gavin's grandmother. I, I want her to accept some responsibility. Delina, could you look at me? For what she's done to me. And from her own heart, make some amends, as opposed to people telling her what she has to do. As Delina cries from her seat in the courtroom, it will be Judge Talia Farrow and Judge Talia Farrow alone who will decide Delina's fate. But before she makes her decision, Delina will get one last chance to convince the judge she shouldn't be locked up for her offense. At this time, then, Mr. Chalfant, I will permit Delena to say whatever it is that she would like to say, and then I will render my decision. Coming up, Judge Talia Farrow seals Delena's fate. You owe. You owe. And new beginnings and old wounds, how this teenage mom surprises everyone with her wrenching decision. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about it. And a fight at home leads to the unthinkable for this teenage boy and his mom. I don't know what's next. We um, filled out the paperwork. And it was like I was signing his life away because, I, you know, they're asking for all his information, you know, his birth certificate. And so it's like I'm giving him away. But And a young girl struggles to break free from a life of shackles and medications. Joshua went up to his sister with a pair of scissors. I didn't see it. She came out of the bathroom screaming.
It's a warm fall morning in this community just outside Chicago as another long day begins for juvenile judge Mary Beth Bonaventura. The judge, a 22-year veteran of child welfare court, watches as 13-year-old Joshua enters her courtroom. This is where the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth. Joshua is here today after a weekend of violence at home. But this fresh-faced seventh grader isn't the victim. He's accused of being the perpetrator. All right, we're here today for uh, a charge of battery. And that happened in your home, is that right, ma'am? Yes. Do you want to tell the court what happened? Joshua went after his sister with a pair of scissors. I didn't see it. She came out of the bathroom screaming, and I told him to go to his room, and he didn't want to. He threw stuff at me, and then he walked out of his room. When I walked out, followed me, and then he punched me in the face with the fist. Um, he split my lip and made my head go back against the wall. Then he choked me, then he spit on me, and I told my daughter to call 911. This is the first time something like this has happened? To this extent, where he punched me, yeah. Are you afraid of Joshua? Yes. Do you want him to come back into your home? No. So at this time, you don't want to take him home with you? No, I, I don't know what else to do with him. I'm Have you had him to any counseling or yes, any evaluation? he's been in counseling since he was in third grade. Like so many kids who end up in front of Judge Bonaventura, Joshua has been in and out of trouble for years. But this is the first time his behavior has landed him in juvenile court. You will see the experience will leave his whole family overwhelmed and confused. He's been in a juvenile detention center for four days waiting for this hearing. And today, he's about to find out his latest outburst has cost him a huge price, his home. Because his mother says she can no longer deal with him, the judge almost has no choice in her course of action. And in front of our cameras, this boy who came into court a juvenile delinquent, still under his parents' care, leaves a ward of the state. In legal terms, Joshua is now a child in need of services. Today the court will find probable cause to believe this child has committed a delinquent act. Refer the matter to the prosecutor's office to file a petition. The court will order that the child also today be made a temporary ward of the Division of Family and Children and order that he undergo a psychological evaluation. And I will order that the Division of Family and Children find placement for him. Joshua, do you have any questions? No, ma'am. All right. This hearing's adjourned. Thank you. As the bailiff leads Joshua out of court, it's up to his mom and stepdad to make it official. They signed the papers temporarily giving their son over to the custody of the state. I wanted to say, no, I want to take him home. You know, he's my son. I, I need him at home. But I also knew that I have to do the best thing to help him. They're asking for all his information, you know, his birth certificate. And so it's like I'm giving him away. He came out and he was just so angry and, and so, I mean, yeah, but I wanted to hug him. I wanted to say, Josh, I love you. You know, it's not because I don't want you or because you're terrible, but I don't know. I just couldn't. I had to make the point that, Josh, you really, you stepped over the line. You're here because, you know, you really went way over. Back inside, Joshua tells our producer mm -hmm. he sees things differently. Mm -hmm. Were you sad? Yeah, because my mom said she didn't want me, so. Do you think that that's really how she feels? Yeah, I, I, I want to go live with my dad in Texas, but I don't think they'll let me. I only get to talk to him like twice a month because my mom doesn't like me talking to him. I asked him if I could call him and she'd be like, no, no, no. Most of the time I, when she goes to work, I just still call him. If you could have a perfect situation right now, what would it be? My mom would be standing right here and I told her I was sorry and asked her if she'd forgive me. And then I just tell her that I want to live with my dad because it'd be better for both of us. His mom says she and Josh's dad divorced when he was a toddler. By the time he was in grade school, fits of anger became the norm. But no one in the family suspected things would ever get this bad. Josh now finds himself caught up in the juvenile justice system. And he and his family will soon learn it takes time, lots of it, to be free of that system. Now you know why I shot these, right? This is in case you guys run away. Because if you run away, I'm going to give this to the police department. I'm going to give it to every police department in the state of Indiana to find you. 
I would have preferred to work with Joshua in the home with the parents and in some intensive counseling, maybe Joshua on probation, a probation officer going to the school, going to the home, monitoring his behavior, uh, maybe doing some parenting classes and some parenting skills in the home with the other children. That opportunity wasn't there. So what I can only hope for now is that through therapy and Joshua maybe growing up a little bit on his own, maybe some separation, maybe she'll miss him and want to work harder on it, that we can reunite them. Because as I told her in court, as much as we like Joshua, it's still her child, and the law says that we have to reunite families, and hopefully we can work toward that. I mean, the verbal abuse is one thing, but, you know, and I told him, if he wants to hit me, hit me. I'm 6'4", 240 pounds, and knock yourself out. You know, we bought him a punching bag, so he could punch that when he got angry. You know, it's not like we as parents haven't tried everything that we've been in the rainbow program he's been in banana splits we've been to family therapy he's been in individual therapy he's on medication to try to control his uh, anxiety it's to the point where he has to understand that he's responsible for his actions and i think that's what his problem is he doesn't understand that he is responsible for his actions now four days after beating up his mom joshua faces the consequences he has no idea where he's headed or for how long because like i don't even know where i'm going or anything. It's like they're just pulling me like I'm a dog on a leash. What should the state do to help a boy like Joshua? As his parents now learn, signing over your child to the custody of the state has enormous, far-reaching consequences. Teams of counselors, therapists, caseworkers, and other specialists will now decide where Joshua will live and for how long. And in the next two weeks, Josh's life will take a drastic turn. Coming up. She grabbed a kitchen knife and threatened to stab her sister, threatened to kill herself. And then she took a coat hanger, put it around her neck. Joshua isn't the only teenager swept up in chaos. In a quiet rural Indiana town, we see pain, tears, and shackles that normally remain hidden behind closed doors. She got into an argument with her sister, and she asked me for a cigarette, and I said, no. I said, you don't need one. Well, I'm going to kill myself. For nearly eight months, 13-year-old Connie has been a patient at Meadows Hospital, a facility that specializes in behavioral health problems. Her mom tells us the story of how Connie became a ward of the court and why the state had to take control when she no longer could. She took off in my room, don't know how much or what quantity of pills she did take. She grabbed a kitchen knife, um, threatened to stab her sister, threatened to kill herself, stab herself. Well, we fought the kitchen knife off of her, got that. And then she took a coat hanger, put it around her neck. And at that point, I had seen her eyes and I knew that she took quite a bit, whatever she did, and she didn't have a whole lot of time. The past eight months at Meadows Hospital have been a hellish ride for Connie. She's in court today on a battery charge, accused of assaulting staff at Meadows Hospital. Connie's case is a complicated one. A young teenager with severe emotional problems, violent outbursts, and a family in turmoil. The judge must decide today whether to keep Connie at Meadows Hospital or send her to secure detention if there's probable cause to believe she beat up staff at Meadows. And just in the past few days, there's a new incident to deal with. Um, she was asked, I believe, to um, take a time out. She refused to do that, went to her bedroom, um, was given an opportunity to come out on her own, refused to do that, did subsequently come out and in the process shoved the staff into the wall. Um, she was taken down and during that process um, spit and kicked, tried to scratch, and we just became highly aggressive in that process of just trying to get her to the quiet room. Is she under a medication? Yes. Connie's therapist proceeds to run through a litany of drugs, Celexa for depression, Depakote for aggression and mood stabilization, Zaprexa for impulsivity, and Triazodone, 
at night to help her sleep. Every individual has to accept responsibility for him or herself. And, and we, I don't expect any more of these young people who come into court than they are capable of doing. Nearly an hour goes by as witness after witness tells Judge Talia Farrow that Connie's behavior at Meadows Hospital is out of control. Connie's placement coordinator accuses Connie of 20 assaults against supervisors, staff members, and other peers. I think Meadows has done the best that they can with um, Connie's behavior. I think she needs to suffer some consequences at this point in time and probably should have suffered some consequences a long time ago. So I do think secure detention would be an appropriate placement for at this point in time. With no jury to guide her, Judge Talia Farrow must quickly determine what's best for Connie. Court testimony alone will not sway the judge. She's known for her compassion, but... But I can also be very firm and very direct. If we do anything for the people who come into our court, the families uh, that are in disarray, we should be trying to empower them. So we have no reason to feel sorry for them or to pity them because they're not pitiful people. They're people whose lives are in distress. Still, there's even more disturbing information the judge must take into consideration. Connie isn't the only child in her family to come through the child welfare system. Her brother Jeffrey is in foster care for what his mom calls behavioral problems. Connie's sister, Samantha, was a runaway at 14 and now nervously waits at home while Connie sits in a courtroom just miles away. Samantha says it's hard to watch her family self-destruct. Well, I can say this is pretty bad being locked up and not getting able to see your mom and dad every single day. And to see your brothers and sisters get locked up, when I first see my little brother get locked up, I mean, it was hard on me too. I know it's hard on him. But right now, the focus is on Connie. Her court hearing has been emotionally draining. After eight months in the hospital, has Connie had her last chance? Connie, you need to control yourself. Will the judge spare Connie time in secure detention, or is she destined to be behind bars? Next, an angry dad lashes out at the judge who controls whether or not he can see his son. He's saying that I can never see my son again because of this And how life can change dramatically in the years to come. She is proving me to be the crazy one. I don't have any control over that, but if you get found guilty, what's going to happen to you? So you're saying that I can never see my son again because of this bull****? Sir, you, you say that again and you won't see him, that's right. Well, it's not fair for me not seeing him, I didn't even point a damn gun you're at him. You're not going to see him right now until I decide, do you understand? It's a yes, this no is, question. I'll tell you one thing, this court, man, this is crazy stuff, man. For more than seven years, we've been tracking children and their families swept up in America's child welfare system. They are among hundreds of thousands of at-risk kids who land in the courts every year. Sometimes they're hauled before a judge for their despicable behavior, but too often it's because home is no longer a safe place. That's the case with this two-year-old, whose parents call him Baby Raymond. He's caught in the middle of their violent feud. Their battle is about to play out in front of Indianapolis juvenile judge James Payne. The point is, is there any reason for you to be around her? No. Any reason for you to be around the children if I tell you you can't until I get all these reports done? No. The baby's father, Raymond Cruz, came to this hearing today from the Marion County Jail, where he's awaiting trial for allegedly stalking the baby's mother, Dana and taking off with baby Raymond. And what's going to happen if you go around? Or contact, letter, phone, or anything? What's going to happen? Go back to jail and I don't want that. You understand, if you go around her, try to contact her or the children, you'll go to jail, probably prison, probably for a long time, and your father will lose his house. Is that what you want? 
But in fact, Raymond's criminal case is of little concern to Judge Payne, whose focus is on what's best for the child. That's why Dana doesn't even have custody of baby Raymond. He and his half-sister are staying with Dana's parents, and she only gets limited visitation. The judge isn't taking any chances that Raymond will get out of jail at any point and go looking to harm his girlfriend or the kids. So how long is it going to be no that a guy can't see? Until I get these reports on everything and until well, your well, criminal case is, is over. You, no, hold it. What you're saying is that she is proving me to be the crazy one. I'm saying I'm worried about these children. I don't care about you two at all. You know? You understand that? I don't care whether you stay in jail or get out of jail. I don't care whether she goes somewhere or she does anything. I don't care. I care about these two children. I'm not going to let these children be put at risk. Yeah. And because of his actions, Raymond risks not seeing his son for a long time. He's facing 10 years in prison. I'll tell you one thing, this court, man, this is crazy stuff, man. Because her family got me to look like I'm a damn nutcase. That's the reason why I'm here today. I wasn't stalking her. I'm in a damn criminal court, but a mean ass judge don't really give a damn. We'll have you back here on the 28th of July to find out what happens. And then we'll talk about then whether or not she can visit. Okay. So if I get found guilty, you're going to say, well, you're going to take my visitation because he said I stalked her. How the f can you stalk her? Ask Sir, me, the next time you use foul language here, I'll remove you right now, and then you won't find out what's going to happen. Do you well, understand? Ask me, how can you stalk Do you understand that, sir? Yeah, I can understand that, but how can you As the you? hearing ends, Dana is frustrated that this day in court doesn't end with her getting her kids back. I mean, I want to do is spend time with my son. When I get out, and that's what I want, man. I don't want nothing to do with Dana. But Raymond's mood quickly turns, and it's not only Dana he has in his sights. Yeah, I don't like him, period. I never did like him. You you know, think I, my, my, my opinion is I think he's a crummy mother judge, and I'll tell him that straight up to his face tomorrow. After 14 years in juvenile court, Judge Payne has learned to block out the insults. When he leaves his courtroom at night, he tries to go home with a clear conscience. But there are no juries in juvenile court. All decisions rest with the judge, and so often their safety is an issue. I think, I think a lot of judges suffer through that, and that is the decisions we make are pretty convicting for families, for parents, for individuals. I, like I suspect many judges, have lived under the, the threat of someone harming me. Um, I've had police security and others, like many judges have. Uh, in this business of dealing with people's lives has tremendous rewards in seeing people change their lives and positive things happen, and it has some negatives, like having your life threatened. It's just part of the business. While it's obvious Raymond's temper clearly got the best of him in court, no one knows for certain how he'll react if he's convicted in his criminal case and loses visitation with baby Raymond. I know where she works. You know, I know where she, I know where she's at. She can't run and she can't hide. Can Raymond cope or will he ultimately blow his chances for seeing his son again? Coming up, years in prison and a little boy with no real place to call home. The shocking revelations of this angry dad and his son. Chelsea could be in the same community with her mother because her mother and stepfather had such a wonderful, close relationship. With yeah, her. I'm concerned about the way she gets treated up at Meadows. I know she gets out of control. Child Welfare Court, rural Bloomington, Indiana. Judge Viola Talaferro faces a stack of cases this morning, and this one will prove to be one of her most difficult. Uh, Chelsea could Linda is a low-income mother of three and is in court because of her nine-year-old daughter, Chelsea. Chelsea has been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit disorder, and is mildly mentally retarded. State's attorney Steve Galvin tells the court that Linda can no longer cope. Linda agrees and, in fact, uh, has asked for the intervention of the Office of Family and Children in this matter. Is that correct? That's correct. She's trying her best. Is that correct? Yes, she is. But there are times when a parent's best just isn't enough. 
Today, Linda does something most parents can't imagine even on their child's worst day. She asked the court to take her daughter away. You really put forth a, well, I don't have the word to describe the effort that you've put forth to keep your daughter at home with you. Yeah. On a bad day that, um, you know, like if her mind's made up to where she don't want to do nothing, you have to struggle with her, argue, fight her. She's, you know, like if I have to restrain her, she's throwing me around in my living room you know, picking up boards, hitting me in the head. These cases present enormous problems for parents because the, the cost of caring for them is just overwhelming. And many, many, uh, most people cannot afford to pay for the care of these children, and there are not enough facilities for them. So you have parents uh, such as Chelsea's mother who will try every way that can be tried to keep the child at home. But if the child is unmanageable, uh, it cannot be done. I've tried to maintain her for nine and a half years, and I can't do it no more. And I'm just hoping that they can keep her here in Bloomington at the Stone Belt where I can see her more often. Linda is asking the court to temporarily place her daughter in a facility close to home. Attorney Galvin knows another place, Daymar, might be better for Chelsea's many needs but it's nearly an hour away. I think also we, we've been discussing being able to, tra to, uh, to transition her into Daymar if possible. That's a little bit further away, Linda. Were you aware of that? Uh, yeah, and then um, I was just wondering, like, if, um, you know, the state or someone's going to pay for the Daymar. Daymar uh, is an established like private facility in Indiana serving children with developmental disabilities. But there's usually a waiting list. Last year alone, we had over 160 kids referred to our organization that needed help, a lot of help, that we weren't able to help because we didn't have the capacity. We no longer uh, get the kids referred to us that um, are having mild or even moderate pr uh, problems. These are really, really intensely troubled kids. A month passes while Linda and Chelsea wait for word on where Chelsea will be placed. I further that Chelsea should be transferred to Daymar when an opening becomes available. And at Daymar, Chelsea will obtain the special care and treatment provided by Daymar. Uh, Daymar, of course, is a long-term residential placement and will provide Chelsea with the structure that she needs. Do you know very much about Daymar yet? Uh-uh. Do you want to go up there before your daughter is transferred Yeah, I'd there? like to, yeah. Linda makes one visit to Daymar before Chelsea moves in. She's impressed with what she sees, but still can't come to terms with the decision she's made. Yeah. I sit at home every night thinking, you know, did I do the right thing? I mean, I know I've got to be doing the right thing because, I mean, I can't give her the special needs that she needs to maintain out here in the world and stuff. And I mean, but I just still beat myself up thinking, am I just giving her up or what? But but I want to do the right thing. What we see on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, more akin to an emergency room atmosphere uh, than uh, it is a regular courtroom situation. And uh, for the judge, when she comes into this courtroom every day, she knows what she's going to hear. And you have to deal with that not just on Tuesday, but next Tuesday, and the next Tuesday after that and a week after that. It's called Children in Need of Services for a reason. Obviously, I cannot uh, single-handedly make changes, and some things are never going to be that much better. But the question is, can something be done? And the other question is, will I see that it happens? I don't think I can do much more than that. The judge knows doing something can also mean a heart-rending separation of child and parent. And that's exactly what's in store for Chelsea and her mom in the months and the years ahead.
just want everyone to know that's been involved in my case and that I know that I have been a disappointment and that I am very angry at myself and that I want to be a good person and I don't want to go through the court system like this. I hate it. At this time, then I will permit Delena to say whatever it is that she would like to say, and then I will render my decision. 17-year-old single mom Delena, who has been in and out of foster homes for 13 years, is facing the biggest challenge of her life, her trial on theft and forgery charges. Delena is in front of juvenile court judge Viola Talafiero after stealing checks from her foster mom of two years. It's now time for her to explain to the judge and her friends in the courtroom how her years as a model foster child and teenage mother led to a day like today. I just want everyone to know that's been involved in my case and that I know that I have been a disappointment and that I am very angry at myself and that I want to be a good person and I want to do good things and I want to succeed. And I don't want to go through the court system like this. I hate it. So I, I just do want everybody to know that regardless of if you don't think that I am remorseful, I am, and I am truly sorry. That's all I want to say. First of all, the most important thing is what are the appropriate consequences for a young person who commits theft and forgery. But what about the remorse? She hasn't shown remorse. Delena has had more than adequate time to make amends if she could. Is Delena a bad person? I don't think so. Is her behavior unacceptable? Of course. So what is appropriate will be four months of formal probation, 30 days in a security detention facility, participation in the Victim Offender Reconciliation Program, and monetary restitution to be paid in full to Kathy Brown, complete the Youth Education Shoplifting Program in order to understand the effects of stealing. Now, I have not said exactly what the recommendations are. I am going to send you to detention today for five days, and I will suspend the 25 days. So you will go now with Miss Kane out of this room, out of this door. And Delena, I wish that I could have seen you walk out of the door leading to the outside. You owe, you owe Miss Brown an apology. This is not the end of your life, but your future, Delena, is in your hands. Delena, will you go with Miss Kane, please? wasn't here for all of the good she'd done in the past. She was here because she committed two offenses. Her future's in her hands. I do not know what that will be. It's hard for me to untangle my hopes for her with my hopes for Gavin. Um, I think I said in there, my initial goal was to be a mother to Delena and a grandmother to Gavin. I'm scared to death that if she gets Gavin back, that I'll never see him again. 
Um, and I, I couldn't live with that. The research does demonstrate very clearly uh, that, that there's a strong likelihood that a young person who's been in foster care for a lengthy period of time may well end up in delinquency court. So do I think about that? Yes. But if you give them, quote, slack, then are you sending a message to this young person that this kind of behavior is appropriate, continue to do this? No. You say, stop. Stop now. Make changes. Five days later, Delina is released and begins weekly visits with Gavin, who continues to live with Kathy. But as time moves on, Delina faces aging out of a system that has been her lifelong safety net. By winter, she is pregnant with her second child. Now 18 and on her own, she makes perhaps the most mature decision of her young life. She voluntarily gives up her parental rights to Gavin and lets Kathy adopt her young son. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about it. It's very hard, but I know that Gavin is in a safe place. It wasn't a decision that I wanted to make, but unfortunately, it was a decision that I had to make. Today, at age 23, Delina refuses to feel sorry for herself. She still visits Gavin every week and has repaired her relationship with her former foster mom. Kathy and I have a, a very good relationship. Um, we've, we've, we've come a long way. Um, Kathy's helped me out a lot. Um, she's, she's still done a lot for me than um, anybody would do um, under the circumstances, and I'm very thankful you know, to her. Kathy and Gavin live just 20 minutes away from Delina. Despite the goodwill between the two, the wounds are still healing. I mean, there were periods of time when um, after Gavin started calling me mom, there was a lot of tension. But we've essentially agreed that we need to have a routine and that um, once a week for a couple hours is, is good for Gavin. There were great times and awful times with Delina when she was here, and there have been that since she left and, and since I've adopted Gavin. Um, but for the most part, it's been a uh, it's been a richer life. Coming up, one more twist in this young woman's complicated life story. It's always corny when people say it, but seriously, never give up. You have to continue on. And if you don't love yourself, then you can't love anybody else. And can years in placement help a child like Chelsea, or is she destined for a life in the system? and the painful reality of loss. Joshua's mom deals with the consequences of her decision to temporarily give her son over to the custody of the state. I just want him to know how much he's loved, even though we're not together. Five stories. Seven years in the making. Can you judge what will happen? Has the child welfare system done what's best for these kids? Joshua went after his sister with a pair of scissors. I didn't see it. She came out of the bathroom screaming. He threw stuff at me and then he walked out of his room when I walked out, followed me, and then he punched me in the face with the fist. Um, he split my lip and made my head go back against the wall. 
Then he choked me, then he spit on me, and I told my daughter to call 911. When we last saw 13-year-old Joshua, his mother was distraught. He was confused. Joshua's parents had just signed over custody of him to the state. As Josh's mom and stepdad left the courthouse, no one knew for certain where he was going or for how long. By the time we see him again, Joshua is a veteran at Alternative House, a temporary placement facility for children in need. It's like I miss my mom and my family, but I don't miss them. I miss them, um, but I know it's better for them. It's like I'm sacrificing myself because I know it's better for them. Um, it's like this is like a big ro waiting room. I'm waiting to know where I should, where I'm going. And then why, why do I think I should be in the place where I'm going? It's because I'm gonna get help there. You're gonna help me. Joshua's been in a holding pattern at Alternative House for 30 days. But this afternoon, his life is about to take a radical turn. After lunch, Josh will be loaded into a car and transported back to juvenile court, where he will face battery charges for hitting his mother. Well, I prayed that when we go to court, and I'll probably tell the judge where I want to go. I won't be shy to tell the judge and thank him for the food, and that I could probably get out of here anytime soon. She'll make the decision where I can make out to get out of here anytime soon. Like that is the fantasy of a naive young child who doesn't quite grasp that home is no longer an option and that his opinion doesn't count when it comes to figuring out what's best for him. About 40-some uh, percent of our kids go from emergency shelter back home or to a family member. Uh, but in Joshua's case, that would not be a safe thing for everyone involved. He needs a lot more supportive services and perhaps for an extended period of time. Sometimes Josh will have a perceived wrong, oh, so-and-so got in line before me, or he stepped on my shoe in the lunch line or whatever, and all of a sudden he's ready to cut loose with profanities that you wouldn't expect out of this sweet little face. And he can go from zero to 65 just like that. He's, his motor is running all the time. Some cars. I just hope I get to go to a placement because they told me I might be going to the Ark in Wisconsin and then they told me I'd be going to Cornerstone and I'm hoping I go to Cornerstone because I don't know nothing about the Ark. The place Joshua will call home for the next six to 12 months is likely either the Ark, located several hours away in Wisconsin, or Cornerstone, which is close by. Joshua has no idea where the judge will send him. Well, the testimony that you're about to give would be the truth, the whole truth. Nothing but the truth to help you, God. I do. Please be seated. This is the matter of Joshua Cordell, cause number J99. As his battery hearing gets underway, Joshua has one shot to plead his case to the judge. Uh, said child did knowingly or intentionally in a rude, insolent, or angry manner touch Angelita uh, which resulted in bodily injury. You are charged with battery. Do you admit or deny that? I admit. You admit? What did you hear? I don't really. In the face, on the arm? In the face. But it was an open fist. It wasn't close. Okay. So then you went outside. And then the police came? The hearing continues with Joshua's case manager explaining that both Cornerstone and the Ark have accepted Joshua for placement. One facility has been recommended over the other. The case manager reports it has more kids Josh's age and can provide the intensive counseling he and his family need. Joshua's mom isn't so sure. We're not familiar with either program. Mm -hmm. And we know that family therapy with Joshua is something that's I, we really need that, and I don't know how easy it would be to do that if he's placed farther away from home than, you know, the cornerstone. I guess my ultimate goal would be to look at a person's family situation as objectively as I can, and hopefully I've been given enough information, um, good and bad, uh, so I can assess the situation so that I can direct them in the areas that they need to be directed to to get their lives back together. Uh, hopefully that I can do that in a fair way. 
uh, and not going with any preconceived ideas, which is very difficult in this position because as a judge, that's what you do. You judge. With a case file of information in front of her, with testimony from the therapists and counselors and family members, the judge is ready to make her decision. What I'll do today is, um, as I said, make the child a ward of the court, order that he be placed at the R. With those words, Joshua's hopes for help close to home are dashed. Joshua, do you have any questions, honey? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, good luck to you. Outside the courtroom, Joshua and his family get a chilling slap of reality. The transportation has already been arranged, and they need to speak with you. Okay. So that they can give you directions and make sure all your questions are answered. So okay. we should take, uh, like, his winter coat and stuff like yes, that up there? Yes, a lot of um, winter coat because it's cold in Wisconsin oh, yeah, or in the wintertime. <laughs> Other than that, the Lake County Division of Family and Children is dismissed, and the probation department takes over from here. I'll see you, Josh, tomorrow, okay? I'll bring you the video. <laughs> all right, thank you. So did you understand everything? Yeah. You ready? You understand it's not because we don't want you, it's because you need to get some help so you can be a better person. So you're not a statistic? Is okay. there anything you want? Mm-mm. You want your blankets? Anything no. Still fit you? No. Anything else? No, you sure? Well, why are you so quiet? It's not in the store. Okay. Hmm? Is it okay? There's nothing else to say. I think Kathleen's waiting for you. Bye. Love you. I'm sorry, I don't get a hug. Hmm? I don't get a hug. He's not the true delinquent. This is his first referral to the court. And seldom do we place children on a first referral. So when she said, no, I don't want him here, I feel that if a parent says, I don't want my child, that's a red flag to me. That was my, my one biggest thing going into it was, you know, Joshua's just gonna be so mad at me for sending him away. You know, how is he ever gonna get over it? I struggle with that and, and hope that he sees, you know, that with enough attention and enough guidance that he'll be able to see why we as parents did what we did to help him. You know, Josh is still a part of the family and, and we know that Josh is still, you know, here with us, you know, in spirit, but he's away. Joshua will remain at the Ark for at least another 10 months. Um, I guess my wish would be that even though he's not with family and, you know, he's at the unit, he realizes that, you know, we still love him. I just want him to know how much he's loved, even though we're not together. That's all. Coming up. It probably doesn't surprise me a lot that you haven't been able to find him. This Joshua's journey through the child welfare system and the surprising facts surrounding his case seven years after we first met him. Drug, alcohol, and an angry judge who expects some answers. And directed by the, your behavior to get your wish by physically assaulting someone is of great concern to this court. You did not learn very much at all from open arms. have done the best that they can with um, Connie's behavior. I think she needs to suffer some consequences at this point in time. Connie's troubles only got more complicated after she was sent to Meadows Hospital for trying to assault her sister and her attempted suicide. In her eight months at Meadows, a facility that specializes in behavioral health problems, Connie racked up 20 reports of assault on the staff. And that's what brings her to court on this day. So in my mind, it, it's very important if someone has committed an offense, particularly an offense that would be a felony if committed by an adult, that some 
some kind of consequence that, rep that takes away or at least will give the child, the young person, an opportunity to think about it. While the judge would normally send someone with a record of assault like Connie's directly to juvenile detention, she's concerned the amount of medication Connie is on is what's affecting her behavior. Um, she was asked, I believe, to um, take a time Before out. she makes a decision on where to send Connie, back to Meadows or to secure detention, she hears one last piece of testimony from Connie's counselor. I think Meadows has done the best that they can with um, Connie's behavior. I think she needs to suffer some consequences at this point in time and probably should have suffered some consequences a long time ago. So I do think secure detention would be an appropriate placement for her at this point in time. She sabotaged the placement uh, so that she could go home. She's a young person. And she's not supposed to exercise the uh, judgment of a mature adult. It is obvious that at this time, Connie cannot remain at Meadows Hospital. It is appropriate that she be placed in the facility in Vincennes, Indiana. Connie, you need to control yourself. It's, it's a challenging job, but there are some happy endings. These are people's lives. These are situations they must be decided. How do I do it? I don't know. There are times when I ask myself, how do I do it? Several months go by as Connie sits in secure detention. Unlike her stay at Meadows Hospital, Connie plays by the rules and quietly serves her time. As her next court date rolls around, her mom, Becky, is still worried the judge might not let Connie come home. I hope she says, Connie, you get to go home. I do know it's going to be tough. She will be placed on very strict probation. But I think home, being with the people that she loves, uh, is what she needs. The judge hears testimony on how Connie has fared in secure detention. She now has to weigh the options of what to do next. We would be asking that the court order Connie on probation for six months. That would be supervised. Uh, Ms. Hamilton, do you think that this is uh, an appropriate recommendation for disposition? I do, Your Honor. I've discussed this with Connie, and I think she's very eager to go home and try to make it work. Connie, do you understand that you were in placement and you are out of placement because of your behavior, because you committed a battery on a staff person? Yes. And did you, did you do this because you were hoping that you could get out of placement and go home? Yes. So you intended to do this so that you could get out of placement and go home, is that right? Yes. And you wanted to get the result that you have now, and that's to go home, is that right? Yes. You pushed the staff person so that you could go home. Now you will be on probation. And if you violate probation, Connie, then the consequences, if you come back in this court again, will be more severe than they have been, than they are this time. And I am quite frankly disappointed. Your behavior to get your wish by physically assaulting someone is of great concern to this court. You did not learn very much at all. It is the decision the judge must make. So the judge must weigh the facts, the evidence, the law, and make a fair, impartial decision. That's the job. I think that you owe the community some hours of work and public restitution will be 40 hours of community service done with a not-for-profit institution. So my job is to make a decision, to make the decision that should be made, and sometimes it may appear to be very harsh. But that doesn't mean that I do it without giving careful thought to it.
but it's important to maintain objectivity and not to become overwhelmed with uh, sympathy and emotion and to make a decision that follows the law and reflects the facts of that case. Judge Talia Farrell reluctantly releases Connie to her mother based on the recommendation of the caseworkers and the attorneys, but wonders what message this has sent. Can an explosive child be successful in an unstructured, chaotic environment? And then it can add more to it. Let me leave that much longer. So, all right, you. I lived up to my end of the deal. Well, let's see if you're going to live up to yours, all right? Now comes the hard part. <laughs> you got to move back in with the sister and the brothers and the mom. And, right, go to school every day. It's going to be hard. <laughs> Family therapy, individual therapy. Mental. Connie's success will ultimately depend on her family's support at home, a family we learn will not stay together for long. Coming up, where Connie is today and what our long-term study of kids in the child welfare system tells us. There aren't any magic wands. You know, Cinderella, the fairy godmother, that was just a fairy tale. Show no tears. Oh, yeah. Hello, come on in. Welcome. Hi. Just a minute. Nine year old Chelsea is about to make a heartbreaking transition for a young child. moving an hour away from her parents into a residential treatment facility, Damar. Chances are Chelsea will live here for years. I sit at home every night thinking, you know, did I do the right thing? But I just still beat myself up thinking, am I just giving her up or what? But, but I want to do the right thing. After nearly 10 years of her daughter's uncontrollable behavior, Chelsea's desperate mom, Linda, has made a choice that once might have been unthinkable. She has signed over custody of her daughter to the state, making way for juvenile court judge Viola Taliaferro to send Chelsea to Damar. The Damar staff tries to prepare Chelsea for her move. Look how big that playground is. Big, isn't it? Or, or go get on the swing, then you'll swing. But at just nine years old, she's completely overwhelmed. Some of them want to go home, and they want to go home very badly. Uh, children grieve when they leave their parents, but that doesn't mean that they cannot be happy and adjust very well in another setting. Are you leaving? Well, just a few minutes. Okay. Can you help me? Hey, lay your shoes in your closet. I want to see if I can fit in. I might be able to get him. Let's see. Hey, Mom, my hand. Okay. Hey. Chelsea. Come here. <coughs> Come here. You're going to have some fun up here. Right? <gasps> Don't do anything. You're going to be crying. visit and call. I love you.
to get better. What's the visit you? We'll call you. Write your letters, bring, buy you things. Okay. Am I right? Okay. <laughs> she tell mom to see her later, okay? Because she'll come visit you, okay? She'll come visit. <laughs> Coming up, Chelsea's amazing transformation in her teenage years and how a lifetime in the system affects so many children well into adulthood. So you're saying that I can never see my son again because of this bull Behind the closed doors of America's child welfare courts lies a toxic mix of angry parents, confused children, and powerful judges. So the next time you use foul language here, I'll remove you right now, and then you won't find out what's going to happen. Do you well, understand? Asking, so how can you stop? Do you understand that, sir? Jail inmate Raymond Cruz is learning that the hard way. When we last saw this angry dad, he was in front of juvenile judge James Payne because his son, who he calls Baby Raymond, is a ward of the court, considered a child in need of services. Raymond is in jail on charges of stalking and fleeing from police. Even though he's now behind bars, Raymond wants to see his young son. During his last court hearing, he was furious his visitations had been halted. Well, it's not fair for me not seeing him. I didn't even point a damn gun at nobody. I wasn't stalking her. I'm in a damn criminal court, but a mean-ass judge don't really give a damn. I should be going to prison, man. I don't, I don't Following this court appearance, Raymond returns to his jail cell, where his emotions continue to boil over about Judge Payne and his girlfriend, Dana. I guarantee, like Judge Payne don't understand. He's stupid, because when, when, uh, when that case is over, she'll be back at her mom's house, and I know where exactly where she's at. And she don't even be leaving Bay Raymond there, because they're going to be stupid, because when I get out, I'm coming to see him. You know, I got ways, you know, to see him. Two months after his jailhouse tirade, Dana did exactly as Raymond predicted. Yeah, and I uh, moved back in at my mother's residence, which is with the children, and they're doing real good and uh, real happy, and I'm just really thankful. I hope that Raymond really gets help and he's able to see the baby with no problem because I feel that him being his father is also important for the baby to see too. You know, they think, right now, they think in their book, and Judge Payne thinking in his little sick mind that I'm doing a lot of time, he can erase that. Because I'm going to tell him tomorrow, I'm going to say, I'm not doing a lot of time. And I said, what are you going to do when I get out a year and a half, two years, or a year? You know, you can't run, man. And you know, like two years ain't going to be that bad, because I won't be doing it here anyway. Raymond's visions of beating his criminal charges come to a crashing halt when the criminal courts find him guilty of stalking and fleeing police. He is sentenced to five years in prison. One thing that all judges have to learn is how do you maintain a judicial temperament 
that means I don't lose my temper at you, even if you lose your temper at me. And, and to recognize, finally, that ultimately the authority is in the court. Uh, going off in court generally doesn't solve any problems that exist at any stage, because the bottom line is I can find someone in contempt and lock them up. That seems rather hollow, though, with someone who's already in prison and virtually has nothing to lose. So uh, part of it is then just keeping your eye on the ball, and the eye is, and the ball is, exactly what is going on with this child. And if I lose my temper, if I take umbrage, if I get upset and, and display that and get into a dialogue, we lose sight of what's going on, and that is, what is the best interest of the child? Will there be a peaceful resolution in the case of Raymond and his son? The odds are against it, and seven years later, the final outcome is even more astounding than you might expect. Tracking the long-term effects of the child welfare system on kids and families is never an exact science. In the case of Raymond Cruz, five years in prison have changed a man and his family. Baby Raymond is no longer a baby. He's a 10-year-old boy. And Raymond himself, he's back home, living with his dad and stepmother and helping to raise little Raymond. Yeah, we can be friends, but see, dad don't talk to her. We can be friends. She can come over and visit baby Raymond. I don't really care. I don't care. Uh, like I said, like I said, I was in prison. I learned about God and all that stuff. I'm not tripping over that at all. Here you go. And I want Daddy like her, but Daddy don't like love people too much. Uh, I don't know why. Baby Raymond was bounced from relatives to foster care during the time his dad was in prison. In the end, Dana signed custody papers, allowing her young son to live with Raymond's parents. Raymond's stepmom says the first few weeks with her grandson were tough. Darren, Darren, Darren. Because I still say that he has flashbacks. Because when we first got him, he spilled something. He jumped up and was running to the bathroom to find something to wash it, to wipe it up with, and he was crying. And there for a while, he wouldn't let you touch his food or anything because he thought you were taking it from him. Dana does visit young Raymond even though she no longer has custody. The continued rift between Dana and Raymond still leaves their son with more questions than answers. We try to answer his questions, you know, when he asks or anything. And he's, well, I told him, I said, no, nobody's going to say anything bad about your mom or your dad. I said, because they're your mom and dad. And he's okay. uh, children will believe and remember 80% of what they see and 20% of what they hear. And that is particularly true in the ages of uh, birth to about five. By the time those kids get to our school system and then involved with other systems, if things haven't gone well, it's going to be difficult for the rest of us to fix those children. Earlier, the better. The best prevention, the best treatment is good help early. Raymond's parents admit he is on medication and having a tough time adjusting to life on the outside. Young Raymond is learning disabled, yet he can tell his dad is struggling. Yeah, because um, I love him. I don't care if he's sick, I still love him. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why daddy loves somebody too much. Well, I'm not wrong. What well, one generation tolerates, the next will take to excess. Frankly, if there were a formula, if there were an absolute right way to do it, we'd all be doing it at this point. It is a problem because there is no single answer, and it is doing the best job you can, listening to everybody, and then trying to make a good decision about that child. Our attempts to find young Raymond's mom, Dana, have been unsuccessful. We wonder how she feels about Raymond's release from prison and the limited contact she has with her son. But we can't help but remember her words seven years ago when this whole ordeal began. I know how to die on 911. Coming up, pain, sacrifice, and resilience. How one teenage mom comes to terms with her life and makes good on her promise. I knew this day was going to be coming. Now reality just set in. Oh my God. 
The kids that, that come to Damar have severe challenges. Chelsea has come back and she has done even better in the program. Look at my <laughs> That's it. Nine-year-old Chelsea was a scared and distraught child when we met her several years ago. The traumatic events of her life played out in front of us as a court placed her in a residential treatment facility, Damar, when her mother could no longer cope with her abusive behavior. I want to go home. I know you do. I want you to. Am I right? For three years, Chelsea lived at Damar and made great strides in controlling her anger. She was ready to move on and move home, but couldn't because of her mother's own problems. So instead, Chelsea moved in with a foster family. Outside the structure of Damar, Chelsea found it hard to cope. Just 15 months after moving out of Damar, Chelsea moved back in. I felt great, but I just, I just want to go home and everything. I really want to live with my sister instead of my mom because she's not doing so great. Chelsea is now living in a Damar transitional home, and she's no longer the dazed little girl clinging to her mother's side. She is now a 15-year-old young woman, going to Damar proms and trying to be every bit the typical teenage girl. Chelsea's mom, Linda, visits every week. Got this. Beautiful. This. It's just a skirt. It's just a skirt. This shirt. It's more like mine. And this outfit. And the shoes. Damar residential director Karen Cousy says teaching Chelsea to live independently is key because ultimately she may never return home to her mom before she turns 18. This is a smaller, more laid back atmosphere. Um, she only has two staff and she only lives with two other individuals. So it allows her a more home-like environment where she can practice some of the skills that she's been taught. No one can say for certain when or if Chelsea will return home. Kids at Damar can stay until their 22nd birthdays, but most transition out at age 18. According to the Child Welfare League of America, Approximately 25,000 young people age out of the system each year, and many of those become homeless at some point. When we ask Chelsea where she sees herself in the future, she doesn't hesitate to answer. If you come to see me in five years, I think that, that I'd probably be moved out on my own, and I would like that. against the, the odds and that I've done really good with my life. Um, but I, I don't, I wonder if, if I had like a different life, if I wasn't in foster care, what my life would be like. Over and over, as we've spent the last seven years documenting the lives of children in the child welfare system, we hear the same words. The system is no place for a child. 23-year-old Delina knows this all too well. 15 foster homes, a mother by age 15, and at 18, the decision to let her former foster mom adopt her little boy. Kathy ended up adopting Gavin, and I still have a, a very, very good relationship with Gavin. Um, I'm still his mommy, and um, you know we see him weekly, and um, it's, he just doesn't live with me. After voluntarily giving up her rights to Gavin, Delina's life wasn't empty for long. She and a former boyfriend went on to have a healthy baby boy, Sage, who helps keep Delina's sights on the future. You know, Gavin has said to me before, um, I think you love Sage more than me because Sage lives with you. And, you know, I've explained to Gavin several times, you, you won't be able to understand it yet. And I can't explain to you what has happened until you're older and you will be able to understand. I surrender. <laughs> She's surrendering. <laughs> Although I would want more than anything for Gavin to, um, to be with me and to live with me full time, I'm thankful that I at least have a relationship with him. That's a, that's a leap of love. 
She did that because she, I would imagine she felt that Gavin would have a, a better life, would live in a more stable environment than she could provide for him at that time. But the fact that she has remained in his life has to be a double blessing for, for her, for uh, Kathy, and for Gavin. Delina is now engaged and at age 23, finally enrolled in college. She defies the odds. Only one third of teenage moms receive their high school diplomas. Less than 2% earn a college degree by age 30. But Delina hopes to someday become a nurse or maybe, not surprisingly, a social worker. Oh, I'm gonna do it. It will happen. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, he goes to preschool. And Sage knows how to t count to five in Spanish. Oh, I have that. to decide which way I want to go. You have your own road. And I can either decide to say, poor Delina, you know, nobody cared about me. Or I can say, you know what, nobody cared about me then. But I have the people that care about me now. And I'm going to have the people that care about me tomorrow. And that's how I get through it. That's exactly how I get through it. There's a lot of power that the position has. I am going to send you to detention today for five days. One must be and very careful how one uses that power. Days. It should never be abused. But it is my job to make the final decision. I can't, I can't run away from that. I can't duck it. Delinquent child for committing the delinquent act of battery. If the state is going to be involved in someone's life, then there must be a compelling reason for it to happen. And I am the one who has to make the final decision. One of the last things my biological mother said to me just about three years ago was, Delina, everything that's happened in your life is your fault. And it's not. It's not my fault. But like I said, every day is a learning experience and you cannot beat yourself up over stuff or you won't get to the next day. For seven years, we've been on a journey to understand how growing up in the child welfare system ultimately affects the children it's supposed to protect. When you have public defenders or agency attorneys or foster parents with too many kids that they're responsible for, then they can't do their job. And I was critical for years about people not doing their job. You, know, you understand if there's another positive test for cocaine, I'm going to order the children removed and we're going to find someplace else for them. Yes. If we have a caseload standard of 12 and 17, and a caseworker has a caseload of 35 or 50, they literally can't do their job. And so Judge Payne did the extraordinary. After 20 years on the bench, he resigned and jumped to the other side. He is now the director of the state's Department of Child Services, the very department he railed against as a judge. The system is so complex and so often uncaring and over demanding and doesn't listen often to the children who have to live through it. It's why in, in the system what we talk about now are bringing in foster children who are now adults to say what should we be doing differently and the key often is just care about me, listen to me. Delina is the first to agree with that sentiment and says it's also why she hesitates to pursue a dream of hers a no, career in social work. I, but despite the chaos of her childhood, she doesn't blame the system for the madness in her life. Really, Sometimes there's only so much that social workers can do. She had to place me back with my mom. And um, whenever she found out that I was taken away from her again, um, I saw her several years later and she said, Delene, I'm so sorry. Um, that's what I had to do. That's what, you know, was ordered. Um, so I think that I, I would feel a lot of guilt sometimes. As we've tracked the lives of each child over the years and watched them become young adults, no two stories have been the same. Some, like Delina, have grown more resilient with time. Others leave more questions and answers. And that includes Joshua. He has not been back 
Um, it probably doesn't surprise me a lot that you haven't been able to find him in this day and age, what, one in two marriages end in divorce, uh, so perhaps they even left the area. But no, he's not been back to the juvenile court. Following his year at the Ark, Joshua and his family reportedly got back on track. Then, after so much time, money, and intervention, his case was closed, and all contact between him and the court system was lost. Our efforts to find Joshua have proven unsuccessful. With no national child welfare tracking system, all Judge Bonaventura can do is hope Joshua and his family gain something positive from their experience. In other days, I'm amazed that people are as receptive um, and that they do come around. And then there are families that respond. So those families that respond keep me at this job. At one point, I decided that it would be nice if I, as the juvenile court judge in a large urban area, took on as a challenge some kids to see if we could make a difference, if I personally could make a difference. And so I selected four cases and spent extra time with calling, visiting, chatting. My wife and I took a couple of them to dinner to try to make a difference. I arranged for one girl to get a pedicure and a manicure and a facial, uh, one to get dancing lessons uh, because she loved dancing. Um, two of those have worked out very well. And two I've lost and have no idea where they are. This is everyone? Yes, sir. My upshot of that was I'm not sure that it's possible to make a difference. On the other hand, I'm not sure that I'm ready not to try. After following Connie for seven years, we last found her living with her sister and struggling to get by. But in her early 20s, she was proud she was on her own and out of the system. Since that last visit, Connie has moved on and we've lost contact with her. And so has the woman who worried so much about her as she made the tough calls about her future. I, Connie, I just, I wish I knew. I wish I knew what had happened with Connie. As for the judge herself, she's now retired. They were the people that were pretty much ruling my life. Um, and, you know, a lot, I, I wonder sometimes, you know, why did I get bounced around so much? You know, once I started really having a voice and being old enough to voice my opinion, Judge Telfair really listened to me. I think she did a lot of good things for a lot of people. And In the end, after seven years of filming, what we found is this. Kids raised by the system become dependent on the system. Sadly, there's little in terms of a safety net once they become adults. Their stories are usually shielded from the public. In turn, their names, their faces, their struggles, their triumphs are out of sight, out of mind. With more than a half million children in foster care, 65,000 parents terminated of their parental rights each year, and more than 2.4 million grandparents raising their grandchildren, the system may be no place for a child. But tragically, sometimes, it's the only place. It's always corny when people say it, but seriously, never give up. You have to continue on. And if you don't love yourself, then you can't love anybody else.